So yes, today we are going to talk a little bit about designing for the augmented body in the future of fashion and wearable technology. I'm Amanda Parks, and I'm a fashion technologist and the CTO of Manufacture New York. I often get asked, what is a fashion technologist and how do you become one? And it's a little bit of a sort of uh, complicated backwards story, which involves a lot of design, technology, large-scale installations, small-scale robotics, and a lot of experience design in between. Um, I also founded an algae biofuels company, which has greatly informed my process, and then founded a fashion technology studio, everything from structural engineering for couture down through kind of theater and performance art. But fundamentally, I'm still this person the little girl that was equally comfortable in her engineering overalls as she was in her fuchsia hot pants. Why do people care about the wearables market? It, it is considered the fastest growing segment of the tech industry and the projections are really massive, so people are starting to really pay attention. But this is not the new industry. Potentially it goes back 30 years, but this is what wearable technology looked like when I arrived at the Media Lab in 2002. The aesthetic which I like to call as if a computer threw up on your jacket. So we've actually come a long way at making devices much more beautiful, uh, simple, and compact, uh, but that's primarily what these smartwatches and fitness tracker devices are. They're devices. They're devices that have been strapped to your body. What do they actually have to do with the language of fashion? Of course, inside of the fashion industry, uh, we have started to incorporate them. This is the first uh, occurrence of the Nike fuel band in Vogue in 2013 in fashion saying, okay, the tech world is putting things on our body. Let's try to incorporate them. But this really had the stylists, their work was cut out for them. Because, you know, it's not just about really matching the color of the band, but you can just tell like one of these things is not like the other. And primarily this is because it's a, basically a paradox in motivation. So, when you think about these devices, they're really about the quantified self. They're thinking about, uh, you know, what can you measure about your body? Um, how can we track things? And how do you get as much information and functionality out of something? But in fashion, this notion denies what is possibly the most important thing about fashion, which is that emotion is the killer app. Emotion is what drives us to kind of wear and create what we love to wear. So while we have moved very far from devices that look like this and transform them into devices that look like this, there's still something that is mismatched. There was a recent article from Vanessa Friedman, who's the New York Times fashion director, and she talked about why she was breaking up with her Apple Watch. She had uh, been wearing it for about six weeks, and it wasn't that it wasn't a useful technology, a beautiful, elegant technology, it was that it really wasn't part of her identity. It was a mass consumer product, and it wasn't part of the definition of her unique style. So what we're really talking about is how do we start to create wearables for diversified users and diversified identities? This is actually an important notion to think about how your style is your visual interface with the rest of the world. We dress to define our own characters, and we also dress to define ourselves for ourselves. So there's a couple steps. We're moving in the right direction. Here's one of my most favorite wearables, the only one I wear every day. Uh, this is Ringly, which is first and foremost a fashion-forward ring. It is secondly a notification device, which will tell me if I'm missing a call or a text when my phone is in my purse. This is driven from a place of something that women actually needed. The founder told me about it. We worked together on the, f the first prototype because we both wanted to wear it. Or other sort of more elegant, um, integrated, a true collaboration between Intel and Opening Ceremony, a contemporary fashion company, um, to work with real metals, real stones, real skins, and have a truly integrated curved display surface that feels and acts like a real piece of jewelry. So we're also up against one other issue. We are running out of space on the body. All these devices are going to compete. This is Rachel Kalmar, who's a data scientist for Misfit Wearables. She actually wears this every day to collect data. What is one of my most bizarre headlines? Um, the tech industry can have the wrist. I'm suggesting that the fashion industry take back the entire surface of the body. So this means that we can actually spread the technology all over the body, not that we all need to light up and be cyborgs, but this is really about defining the language of fashion and tech. So something like the MC10 um, flexible, stretchable, amazing circuit band-aid, which you see on the left, the reason it's fuzzy is because it is so small, it's that hard to photograph, um, but it uses, to create the technology of the stretch, it uses something that all fashion designers know as a way to make something seem stretchable, the zigzag stitch. So what I'm doing right now 
is working with Manufacturing New York, which is a manufacturing innovation center. We are a, a fashion incubator and accelerator, a full manufacturing facility, and an R&D technology lab to really look at the future of fashion and technology and textiles. We're doing this in a massive space in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, on the Brooklyn waterfront, uh, 320,000 square feet, and we're using a model called innovation through proximity. So you put all the right people, the creative people, the tech people, the process technologies, and the manufacturing and scale up inside one building, and you kind of let it go forward. So I'm in charge of our R&D technology labs. We're working on not just devices, but enabling technologies, process innovations, and new materials, and through what I call the diamond of collaboration, large tech companies, fashion forward brands, startups, and academic labs. We're creating three interrelated technology labs, the first being digital fabrication focused on soft materials, which also includes combining traditional manufacturing techniques with innovative industrial machine processes, robotics, and 3D printing, and also using things like data streaming and data visualization as part of our technology. So this is a project that uses a data visualization um, feed from Google, from Google News that runs directly into a knitting machine. We're creating a lab for soft circuits and wearable electronics and biology and chemistry labs for biofabrication to do things like, in the right-hand corner, you see BioCouture from Suzanne Lee, a bacterial cellulose leather that's highly sustainable. Because I really believe that biology is the next hardware revolution and this is defining our century in a way that things like physics defined last century. What does this really mean for fashion? Well, one of the things that we can do is to try to change our materiality. So we're not going to get rid of this idea that we want to wear things and change them and have ways to have large wardrobes and to have seasons. But what if the materiality of our garments actually dissolved after the season? So basically, why can't fast fashion work like Snapchat? Inspiration's coming from things like the shrimp chitin 3D prints which dissolve in salt water from the mediated matter group in MIT, and magnesium circuit that dissolves inside of the body from John Rogers. So here's one of the ways that we're living this. On the day that the iPhone was released, this is where I was, <laughs> in the basement of a laboratory in Princeton with Professor Dan Steingart, who's working on making fiber batteries. And what this means is there's two substrates which are coated together as an anode and a cathode and then embedded in a biological agar, which is like a biological jello, which makes the garments not only washable, when you wash them, it actually reconstitutes the full power of the battery. What's interesting about this process is these amazing team of material scientists needed to figure out a way to literally get here. How do we start making a textile from this? How do we actually cross industries? This is what they didn't have in their lab. I took them five miles across New Jersey to the Shimaseki factory where the most advanced 3D knitting machines are working away and they began to be able to plan how you can make a textile that actually determines its current and voltage structure through its knitting pattern. So what we're looking at is a material transformation inside of wearables. When you begin with things like PCB, silicone-based, you end up with devices like the Apple Watch, a beautiful device that has its place. But when you begin with things like fiber batteries, you can have a truly integrated garment with invisible functionality that adds to your life in highly augmented ways. So this brings me to my last point, which is not all wearable technology needs to involve electronics, and we need to stop thinking about it that way. The first company that is in our incubator that deals with this is Thesis Couture. And this is a company that is designing the high heel from the inside out. Uh, this is what is inside every high heel. It's a stainless steel metal shank that has nothing to do with supporting the weight of the body or helping you walk and is actually why contemporary heels are basically torture devices. So the founder of, of Thesis Couture, who is uh, Elon Musk's head of talent, you know, decided to take on this problem with all of the friends and technologists that she had met there. So we have a rocket scientist, an astronaut, a mechanical engineer, an orthopedic surgeon, and an Italian shoe maestro on our team. And we're looking at the problem from dynamic finite element analysis, the loading of the foot in statics, as well as the orthopedics and the biometrics of the foot itself, with IP around uh, the process technology manufacturing, as well as the materials in ballistic grade polymers. So ladies, this launches in November. You can get on the list. The next one is Drupal Fabrics, which is a literally invisible technology, a hydrophobic nanotech process technology for natural fibers. So you can literally throw a glass of red wine at a linen garment, a white linen garment, and it'll roll off. And another one, Kuiho, which is 
very much a scientific poetry. This is Jay Rim Lee, a senior TED fellow and founder, developing an infinity burial suit, which is embedded with a mushroom spore, a fungal spore, that is meant to remediate the toxins in your body after death. And so this is a way to disrupt the toxic nature of what happens in the funerary industry, and also to create a fashion line for people to be able to choose, how can I have a sustainable death, and how can I still look great? And then last but not least, Daniel Silverstein, who is a young designer in our lab who um, is working on notions of zero waste patterning. This is not a techno technology embedded in the garment, but a process technology. And so he has multiple different ways um, to create patterns that have zero waste um, in the textile, and also we're working with him to create software um, that allows this, his amazing mind to be open for other designers. So thank you very much, and you can tweet at me here. Uh, my ring label will tell me.